Welcome everybody to uh, the final seminar for this semester's uh, series. Uh, <clears throat> today, uh, we hear from our very own Brian Daniels, who most of you know, but if you, in case you don't, uh, Brian is a research professor in a new school of complex adaptive system. He is a physicist, but we won't hold them against him. And uh, he will uh, talk today about understanding the logic of adaptive collective behavior. Just as a reminder, this is the last for this semester. We will kick it off again uh, in the next academic year. Uh, and in our faculty meeting, we've decided that this is a good slot, so we keep the slot. So stay tuned for information about next semester series. But now without further ado, Brian. Thank you, Manfred. And uh, usually I would say in a face-to-face -face talk, you know, don't feel, uh, uh, just feel free to interrupt with questions. And you can do that here too. I don't know how easy it's gonna be, but feel free to just unmute yourself and ask something if you are confused. But looking forward to having a good conversation here today. So I'll start here. This is a monkey. Uh, this monkey is looking at the world. Um, and in particular, it's somehow turning signals from the environment, right? It's watching, it's, uh, it's listening, it's turning these signals somehow into actions of what it's going to do next. And so I have um, colleagues who are interested in how this happens in the macaque monkey here. And so they can train these monkeys to, for instance, watch things moving around and tell the experimentalists which way it sees things moving or to really um, bring them into the lab and make it very repeatable. They can show the monkey dots moving on a screen and ask the monkey, are there more dots moving to the left or to the right? And so you can start to learn things about uh, how well the monkey can see, how well it can decide which way these dots are moving. Um, and eventually the monkeys get very good at this, right? You show them dots moving to the left and they're always gonna make the same, they're always gonna be very accurate in uh, making that left core decision. And you can do this for multiple monkeys, they all act basically the same. And, and after a while, everything starts to look very boring at this level. Uh, the, Right? The monkeys are very accurate, they're very reliable, they always do the same thing. But when we zoom in to look at uh, the cells that we think are involved in making this decision, things look very different. So if I look at individual neurons, we can find neurons that represent this decision. But if I record from them uh, in the course of say, watching these dots and deciding which are moving, which, whether they're moving left or right, uh, in each trial, the neurons look very different. Uh, we don't have the same repeatability that we have at the scale of the decision of the monkey. And furthermore, if we look at different monkeys, the neurons look completely different. And if I, and a third point is just that if I look at an individual neuron, I can't tell as much as if I look across the ensemble of neurons. So there's something distributed about this decision. And I'll give just another example here, zooming into a different scale, where again, we have repeatable behavior at the collective level. So here we're looking at a cell membrane and uh, the green thing that you see floating around there is some hormone that the the cell needs to respond to. So if I add this hormone, cells tend to, uh, tend to manufacture a certain protein to respond to them. But again, when I zoom in to see how this works, uh, it looks very messy, uncertain, complicated. Uh, these two, uh, and even this sort of cartoon makes things look simpler than, than they are in real life. Um, you know, these, these two red things have to coordinate to catch the green guy. That causes some other thing to be phosphorylated, which causes another uh, protein to change its behavior. There's this whole cascade until finally uh, 
um, some DNA gets transcribed and we get the protein that we want manufactured. So again, there's, if I look into individual cells and ask uh, what proteins are doing, it looks very uh, noisy, uncertain. And <clears throat> similarly to the macaques, if I look, say, in a different species, the, the same, right, the same, even the same um, signal at the cell surface might cause the same transcription of some protein inside, but the, the way that happens can be different. And so these are examples uh, of collective behavior that, that we're interested in. And basically the, the big picture story here is that we're looking at a microscopic to macroscopic mapping where we have some aggregate consequences uh, that are coordinated, they're adaptive, they seem purposeful, but these are controlled by components that are noisy, fluctuating, sort of distributed, uncertain, very particular, um, and yet they produce this very repeatable and um, adaptive response at the macroscopic scale. And this happens all over biology. Um, I also include two examples here, say of a fish school that um, when one fish sees a predator, that signal can be transmitted to the other fish so they all know to turn away. Uh, this colony of bees, uh, when they decide to find a new nest, uh, individual bees look at multiple nest sites and that's coordinated somehow into the entire colony moving to a single new site. And so in each of these cases, what we have, there's benefits from coordination. Are there things that these uh, individual components can't do at the end of it, at, by themselves, but they can do more interesting and adaptive things when they work together, when they coordinate their behavior. But also in all these cases, it, when you zoom in to try to figure out how they work, uh, things start to look much more complicated. It's not easy to see how this coordination happens. And so the big question is, well, how is the behavior of these individual components regulated in order to produce some useful outcome at the aggregate scale? Or what I like to say, what is the logic of collective behavior? Uh, how, you know, how do I design this distributed algorithm to produce the correct behavior? And I want to take a small detour here just to uh, hopefully connect to other issues, right, in the spirit of introducing this work to the broader group in the, in the new college, um, that actually the same issues arise in human social systems, right? So we know that humans can do interest, have interesting collective behavior. They can do more and more interesting things together than they can by themselves but this requires coordination. And so from things from uh, a social movement to a city, you know, why do cities form? Because we can do more interesting things together, but that requires a lot of coordination. Uh, to simpler things like a, say this marching band, or, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure where to put this, but our new college, um, the, the organization of it can look as complicated as some of the some of the uh, systems that we're studying. And so I think it'd be an interesting conversation to have, this is the only slide that I'll have about humans, but um, I would like to start this kind of conversation of, well, how are these social systems uh, like the biological collective systems that we study? Or to put it provocatively to sort of start a conversation, in my mind, a brain is really more like a society than it is like a CPU. We tend to think of brains as doing computations, this kind of thing. But actually, when you look into the details, it starts to look much more like these social systems. And so I think this could be an interesting conversation to have. Okay. So back to biology here and just introducing what goes on in my group is 
uh, basically we're looking for this connection between the logical um, sort of input output relations that we get at the collective scale and connecting it to the complicated mechanisms that produce it. And so there are lots of theoretical approaches that people have used to try to think about how collective behavior, uh, about these, these issues of collective behavior. Things like emergence, uh, synergy, criticality, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and at the level of sort of toy models, this has been studied a lot actually. But what's harder to do is to but what we have the opportunity to do now with all of the data that we're collecting from these systems is it is to connect it to the the actual messy details the the causal structure that we see in these real world systems and this is a hard problem um, because extracting causality from this data is a very complicated issue so if i see gene a and gene b being transcribed at the same time in cells does it mean that A caused B? Does it mean that B caused A? Does it mean that some other C caused both A and B? <clears throat> uh, these are the sorts of things that we have to deal with all the time in extracting the causal structure at the individual level from these amazing data sets that, we're, that we now have. So the sorts of tools that we use, uh, data science, machine learning, model inference, uh, statistical physics, uh, comes in handy in thinking about um, these uh, behavior at different levels, the microscopic, macroscopic levels, dynamical systems theory. And also, I want to point out, it's very important for us to have biological expertise in each of these systems to understand how what actually makes sense for what, uh, what these interactions look like. And so that doesn't come from me, but from our collaborators. So it's very important to us to form these uh, relationships with our collaborators, the people who actually took the data and understand how these systems work. And so today I just wanna give you a few examples of, of how we've connected these more abstract theoretical ideas and tried to see whether they are true, how they play out in actual messiness of real biology. So in the first case, let's look again at this uh, example of neural decision making in monkeys. And so if, if, if I'm a theorist and you tell me that um, you have a decision making system that's choosing among various choices and it's being implemented by some neurons, uh, well the simplest thing I can come up with to, to do this uh, just have one neuron basically that represents each decision. So if I have just two decisions, say leftward moving dots and rightward moving dots, I could just have two neurons, uh, one representing right and one representing left. And we could even have, you know, the right neuron is uh, inhibiting the left neuron so that, and vice versa, so that eventually I just get a state where either one or the other left or right is chosen. And so this is basically the idea behind a lot of the theory of decision making. Um, and so it looks fairly simple here, um, just showing a little more uh, detail in the top. We have the three points are equilibrium fixed points. And we get, so if I uh, write down this system in terms of dynamic equations, I can get, say, two stable fixed points, one where left is firing and right is not, and vice versa, right is firing and left is not. And I can get some unstable equilibrium in the middle that represents sort of uncertain state. And uh, it turns out that uh, something called a pitchfork bifurcation, so you can sort of see that pitchfork shape there, uh, is useful in thinking about this um, in the sense that when I have such a pitchfork bifurcation, I can implement this decision in a nice way. I can say tune one parameter. So maybe there's some other set of controlling neurons in the brain that are saying, uh, uh, you know, be ready to make a decision now, in which case I just have one fixed point that's sort of in the uncertain state. 
And then when the external signal says go, then I change to have these two stable fixed points and I drift gradually toward one or the other and make my decision. And then if, uh, if we don't have any other data to think about, if I wanna say, well, why are there so many neurons in the brain? They say, there seem to be a lot of neurons involved. Well, they could be there just to uh, reduce noise in the system. So if I, instead of just having one leftward neuron and one rightward neuron, I could have a bunch of leftward neurons and a bunch of rightward neurons uh, that and when I take the average over those, that reduces the noise. And I can have a very reliable decision-making um, decision making set of neurons. Okay. So that is the sort of naive way that I could approach this problem. And then we want to ask, well, does this actually play out in real neurons? And so that is what we asked. Um, our collaborators were the ones who took this multi-electrode array, put it into the brain of the macaque, and measured over 100 neurons at a time to see uh, what they were doing, how they were re representing perhaps this decision. And so the, the first thing we saw, and which has been known for a while, is that, in fact, it, if I look at a collection of neurons, I, I do see something like what that simple model would have predicted. And that is to say that uh, as, I'm, as, as I look at the firing patterns of those neurons, they will gradually drift one way or the other, depending on what the uh, what the input, whether the dots are moving left or right, the, the firing rates will go into one or the other direction. And I can use that information to uh, predict what way the monkey is about to decide. So in one of these trials you see at the top here, initially there's some visual stimulus, there's some delay period, and then they give the monkey a cue to make their actual decision. And what we're plotting here is the predictive power. So can I actually predict which way the monkey is about to decide before it does it? And so as the model predicts, there's some gradual ramping up of that information. At the time of the go queue, we can predict with about 85% accuracy what the monkey is about to do. So we can read the monkey's mind. And, um, and so everything looks basically how we would expect. But we, what we wanted to ask next was, well, how does this pan out at the level of individual neurons? So I'm going to show you now, if we look at just single neurons at a time, how much information can we get? So here in this plot, uh, every line is a different neuron. And then we ask, uh, as a function of time to the right, uh, if I measure the firing rate of that neuron only, how much information can I get about the eventual decision? And so if I focus on just say one particular neuron that looks nice, uh, it does level. And that is we get a sort of gradual build of information and then it becomes uh, very high just at the time that the monkey is actually deciding. Um, but you'll notice that there's a lot more um, diversity here than we would expect if you just had, say, a bunch of equal left neurons and equal right neurons. Uh, in particular, there's some neurons here that uh, if I measure their firing rate bef before this go queue, I get no information about the individual, about the eventual decision. And uh, only after the go queue uh, do, I, do they have information. And furthermore, if I go down here, there's a bunch of neurons that seem to have nothing to do with what, uh, with this decision, which we might expect, right? There are other neurons doing other things than just making this decision. But notice in particular that there's no good cutoff. There's no like uh, distinct groups of neurons, you know, some of which are involved in the decision and some of which are not. There's just a sort of gradation of uh, some that are sort of, involved and some that are more involved. And then the question we had was, well, can we 
still think about this kind of simple pitchfork bifurcation picture of how a decision is implemented, even when the individual neurons look very messy and uh, very diverse. And so to answer this question, we um, looked into dynamical systems theory, which tells you, well, how hard is it or how do you find these sort of pitchfork bifurcations? And so it turns out that there is a, a procedure for doing this. So if even if I gave you just some random set of dynamics, so some random set of neurons that are interacting in some complicated way, dynamical systems theory tells us that if I'm allowed to vary two parameters at the global scale, so these could be things like that external signal from some other place in the brain, or it could be parameters that are changed during learning. If I'm allowed to change those two parameters, then I can find a pitchfork bifurcation if it exists. And so here's uh, what that looks like mathematically, but basically you have uh, some complicated set of dynamics that are represented in this F function on the right here. And then if I have these two parameters that I can vary, what are called C and A here, then in the, the blue uh, equations will tell me how to follow a curve to find, um, to tune this first parameter. And then I can use the second set of equations to follow a curve to this, find this final point. And at the final point, we, you will always have a pitchfork bifurcation. And so uh, just to give you a um, more intuitive notion of what these things are tuning, basically you have two parameters. One of them is tuning the bias toward one or the other decision. So I don't want the left decision to be intrinsically, you know, I don't want the system to be intrinsically biased toward the left or the right, so I tune them to be equal. And secondly, the, the second parameter is basically tuning the speed of the decision. So uh, if I make my decision too quickly, then I could fall into, say, the wrong decision before I've accumulated all of my evidence. And so if I make, it, make that decision process very slow by tuning the second parameter, then tuning those two things will find a, this pitchfork bifurcation that will produce a decision process. And so based on this, we thought, well, can we just write down then some random, you know, if I just uh, wrote down some neural dynamics that uh, represented some random set of neurons uh, coupled to each other, can we find such a pitchfork bifurcation? And it turns out that you can. And, um, that these are sort of plentiful in the in the model in the simple model that we wrote down, and so what you see on the right here is uh, one of these pitchfork bifurcations that we found in one of these random networks, and so what you see is you're tuning some parameter, you're getting those two different decision states, but now the different colors are different neurons. So the for instance the yellow neuron um, in it represents the decision with very different firing rates. And so that means that it's very, if I measure that neuron, it's very easy to get information about the decision. So it carries a lot of information. It would be very bright in that um, plot that I hit earlier. Whereas the red neuron, uh, it still has two different decision states, but they're sort of close to each other and hard to distinguish. And so that, that neuron doesn't carry as much information. And so we're seeing the exact same kind of patterns come out of this simple model that we see in the real system, uh, which is very encouraging. And so um, just to wrap up that section, then the moral of the story, basically even a complicated mess of noisy neurons can perform this useful task, can make this decision as long as I'm able to vary these two collective parameters. Okay. I'll pause for any uh, interjections here for a moment.
So quickly, Brian, how yeah. generalizable is this from neurons to any kind of decision system? Uh, it's very generalizable, yeah. So, I mean, the, the model that we wrote down, of course, looked like uh, sort of firing rates of neurons, but we could easily uh, apply this to write the honeybees. You know, each honeybee has some uh, level of, uh, you know, wanting to go to say one foraging site versus another foraging site and the collective decision that ensues. Um, so it's very easy actually to generalize these models to, to other systems. Also, if you have more than just two options? Well, that's, yes, that's the question we always get. So, um, yes, that's a very good question. Um, the, there are multiple ways you could deal with that. Basically, you could have multiple decision points where it's not just uh, two decisions, but sort of two become four or four become eight. Um, but there are other, there are other uh, basically attractor structures in dynamical systems theory that people use for more complicated situations. So instead of just having say two possible attractors, you could have an entire line of attractors. And so this is, for instance, how people explain um, orientation. So how orientation is stored in your brain might be one of these line attractors. That's not just uh, you know, discrete possibilities, but it's an entire uh, spectrum of you know, one dimensional line of, of possibilities. Great, thanks. Yeah. OK. So the second example I want to give here is this one of cell regulatory networks. And so in this case, the, the amazing data and sort of experiments that can be done now in single cells are actually producing already networks that uh, look a lot more like what you would think of as logic. Um, and that is to say, right, say one of these uh, individual proteins in the cell, um, we can think of it as just turning on or off depending on some inputs from other proteins. And so you get a sort of logical picture where, um, right, if this protein and this protein or this protein is on, then this protein is on next. And so this is one example of these. This is um, a model of in plants. So plants have pores in their cells that open and close depending on the um, environment, which uh, basically the function is to um, either bring in water or allow water to escape uh, or not allow water to escape, right? In the desert here, we, uh, the plant wants to be able to close those pores so that the water doesn't, um, they don't desiccate, right? Um, and so this is very typical of this kind of um, cell regulation in that even this very simple task of just opening and closing some pore uh, looks sort of Rube Goldberg-esque. It looks very complicated. There, here there are 44 different players involved in the cell in making this decision of whether to open or close uh, the pore. And so our question is uh, sort of how do we understand how these came to be? Can we, is there some um, more abstract level at which we can think about uh, why these networks look the way that they do? And so here I want to talk about this idea of criticality. And this is an idea that theorists have had for many decades about um, these biochemical networks. And that is that basically in a nutshell that if signals in these networks are amplified too much or too little, then the collective behavior is boring. And so um, 
just to think about that in the in the last network. So say I changed one of the proteins from uh, not being expressed to expressed in a cell. Well, how how much is that going to change the behavior? And so if that change is amplified a lot, uh, if it causes lots of changes in lots of other parts of the plant, uh, that could be very hard to control and sort of you have changes um, percolating through, you know, as soon as any one of one thing changes, then everything changes, you get a very chaotic picture. Whereas if that signal is not amplified, then it can't, it has no opportunity to change anything. And, um, and so you can see that somewhere in the middle is where you might expect biology to live. And so we can measure this with um, this uh, just number that we're calling the amplification here. And that is to say, if I, if I change the state of one of the nodes in this network, well, how many other nodes are directly affected by that on average? And so this is easier to explain now in the world of pandemics, because you're all familiar with the idea of reproduction number, which is to say, if I get COVID-19, how many other people on average get COVID-19 because of that? <clears throat> and of course, the, the critical value is one. So if, if I infect on average more than one other person, then that's gonna spread, grow to spread through the whole society, where if it's less than one, that will tend to die out. And so setting amplification exactly equal to one is where these general theories of biological networks have tended to, um, to hypothesize that biology should be sitting because that's where these signals are not amplified too much or too little. And so why, why should we care about criticality? Uh, for one, this is very uh, crucial for thinking about control of the system. So if I, you know, right in the plant example, if I want to be able to uh, close the pore of some, pores of some plant, how many of those protein expressions do I expect to have to change in order to do that? Or in the case of a stem cell that's changing into one or the other kind, you know, a liver cell or a heart cell, well, how many proteins do I have to change to, to force it to be, say, a liver cell or a heart cell? And there are reasons to believe that the system is, say, most controllable where this amplification is equal to one. And so this is something that Enrico and I have been working on. But secondly, this, if this were true, if amplification is equal, is close to one in biology, this would represent a very remarkable constraint on how these systems work. Um, the, it's, it's not necessarily easy for this condition to be met, right? If I just throw sort of uh, chemicals in a bag and, and see what happens, mostly amplification is not going to be one. And so either signals are gonna be dying out or they're gonna be uh, blowing up and causing chaos. And so finding this, it could actually be a, a difficult problem. And, but if that is true, it represents a huge amount of information that we would have a priori about what we expect, how we expect these networks to look. Okay. So theorists have thought about this for a long time and, and the sort of typical way this has been studied before we had all the information about what these networks looked like is to just invent sort of random networks that uh, had this property. So for instance, here, this one is a simple case where each node in the network depends on two other nodes. And the, the logic of each node is set so that we're not biased toward being, ampl uh, we're not biased toward being, say, um, excited or uh, turned on or turned off. And when you, you can just write down a network like this and by definition, uh, the amplification is equal to one. And so you can study, and there have been decades of work on this basically of these random Boolean networks and you can write study their properties and so on. 
But the question now is that we're getting these uh, much more detailed networks of individual biological processes. Uh, is this true? Uh, and so here are some examples. And now you can just find these uh, models. Um, there are huge collections of these models for very different biological systems from plants to animals to single-celled organisms, you name it. Um, and I mean, first of all, what we see is that they don't have this simple structure that say each uh, protein's expression depends on two other proteins. No, you know, some of them depend on say just a single other protein or many other proteins. And so it's a non-trivial question of is that, it, does it turn out that this amplification parameter is close to one? And so we, we took one of these databases and we just measured the amplification in uh, 69 of these or 67 of these networks. And so here uh, we see this histogram of where these networks show up in terms of amplification in red, and they're all very close to one. Uh, indeed, this, the theorists were right. And uh, impressively, it, right, we wanted to know sort of how, um, how carefully tuned are these networks to make this happen. And so we sort of would take each network and play around with it a little bit, you know, change the connections a little bit, change the logical rules a little bit. But basically anything that we did, any changes we made to the system very quickly changed the amplification away from one. And so it seems that biology really is uh, setting very carefully this amplification parameter to be near one. And so the moral here, so again, we're seeing this idea of a collective variable that the amplification in this case that needs to be set somewhat precisely in order to get the right behavior. But it, um, not, it doesn't have to be in this very simplistic way, but it's actually uh, achieved in a, in a way that's very diverse in the components that are being used. Okay, I'll pause again. All right, and I'll tell just one final quick story here. And this has to do with these fish schools that I mentioned. So I have some collaborators uh, now in Germany who study fish and uh, schools of fish. These fish uh, tend to live in shallow water. And so they're basically living in two dimensions. And my collaborators put these fish in just sort of a, a very um, uh, fixed environment that doesn't have any, you know, everything's white. They uh, insulate uh, the room from noise or any other um, changes. And they see what these fish do uh, and how they, right, how they school with one another. But something interesting that they found is that even the absence of any uh, external signals. Occasionally one of these fish will suddenly freak out and uh, so you can see that in the bottom left and uh, what happens is that nearby fish when they see this will tend to startle as well and this startling wave can sort of spread through the school. And so you can imagine that this would be a functional adaptation here that um, say if one fish sees a predator and suddenly startles that maybe the whole school needs to turn around. And so we wanted to study how this happens and uh, how it might be beneficial, right? How this collective behavior could be beneficial to individual fish. And what's wonderful about this data is that um, we don't have to just sort of make up rules about how these fish uh, interact with one another, we can just record, uh, you know, for days and days, uh, 
uh, the how these fish move around. And we can actually just use statistical inference to determine, well, what is it that makes a fish startle in particular? So here's a black fish in, in the middle. And um, we can see not just uh, you know, how far away other fish are, but actually which individual fish that black fish can see, because we know where its eye is and we can sort of trace out, you know, um, because these fish are basically living in two dimensions, uh, some fish are gonna block the view from other fish. And so this black fish can only see these other purple fish. And we can use this to infer what is it that makes fish startle. And so uh, what my collaborators found was that the most important um, factors were basically how many fish total you can see and then uh, how many other fish or sort of uh, how close other fish are when they startle. And so if fish are closer or you can see fewer of them then you're more likely to startle when one of your neighbors does. And so we can make uh, a nice model then about how these uh, startle cascades can move through schools. And what we were interested in is, right, the, the collective benefits that this might have. And um, so again, coming from the theorist mindset, we say, well, we might expect the fish, in this case, to be near criticality, that this amplification should be near one. That is to say, if I startle, I would cause uh, maybe one fish on a, one other fish on average to startle. And the reason we might think that is that um, that the behavior of the whole system is at criticality is most sensitive to what happened at the beginning. So for example, if I had one fish initially startle, maybe that was just noise, maybe that was just uh, not a real uh, predator, and so I shouldn't necessarily want everybody to to change what they're doing. But if, say, two fish startle, then that was that indicates that oh, there was a real signal. Uh, we should all pay attention, and you sort of want the the startle cascade to spread through the entire system. And so, at criticality, at this where this amplification is equal to one, is the place where you expect the biggest difference between say one and two initial fish startling. So we measured what we call that collective sensitivity, how sensitive the whole is to the individuals. And so the first interesting thing is to note is that um, the fish sort of have two different states that they can be in. So first in this baseline state, uh, fish tend to be further away from one another, and this collective sensitivity is low. But when they become alarmed, which we can do in the, in the lab by putting a certain chemical in the water, um, that's actually a chemical that is in fish skin, so if some predator eats a fish, then that chemical tends to be re released. skittish. And what happens is they become closer to one another. And when they do that, uh, the model is saying that the collective sensitivity goes up. And so we might expect that uh, if the fish um, detect that, that a predator is present, then they want to be in this more sensitive state. And so this is an interesting example where the fish are modifying this collective variable, which um, this collective sensitivity by changing uh, things that, that they have control over, right? How far they are away from neighbors. If they just get closer to the neighbors, that's all they need to do in order for this collective sensitivity to increase. Okay, and then the second, okay, and then, right, we as the theorists come in and we say, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to see actually if this system is also close to criticality? Is this amplification near one? And if it is, then this collective, maybe this collective sensitive, well, 
right? The, the theory predicts that the collective sensitivity would be maximal at criticality. And so maybe the, maybe the fish in the alarmed state are getting to that critical point, whereas in the baseline is sort of far away from it. And so to answer that question, uh, we rescale, so uh, rescale distances in the model. So that is to say, we had the original uh, data, so the purple there in the upper right. But we can also ask, because now we have this model that tells us how the behavior changes with, say, distances. We can just say, well, what happens if we just make all the fish farther apart from one another? Or what happens if we cram them all very close together? And conveniently, right, uh, the model is telling us, is also keeping track of, say, which fish can see which other fish and all of this. And we can just ask, uh, what is this collective sensitivity as we rescale and the fish get closer and further away from one another? And so surprise, surprise, we find that actually uh, to get to the maximal collective sensitivity, we would have to cram the fish so close together that it's something that we never see in the experiment, basically. Um, they would have to al almost all be touching each other before, the, before we expect this amplification to be equal to one, this critical point to happen. And so this is interesting. So, uh, right, why, why in other, you know, right, in many cases in biology, we're finding this amplification set very strictly to one, but in this case, no, we're actually very far from criticality. Um, and just to uh, make the connection with, again, with this amplification, I'll show you this plot. So now in the vertical axis here is the individual responsiveness. So we might imagine that it's not just that fish, when they get scared, they get closer to one another, but maybe they just internally change their threshold to startle. So they say, now if I see anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip out, right? Well, actually, we see that the fish, even in the alarmed state, don't change their responsiveness much. And it's just that they get closer together. But in the model, we can imagine that this individual responsiveness would change. And then uh, for the few physicists in the audience, so we can basically map out this phase diagram uh, that shows we have in the upper right is this phase where um, where small where right startles tend to not spread through the whole system. Or in the bottom left, every startle causes the whole school to um, to startle. And in between those two, this dashed line is where that amplification is equal to one, and the red is where this collective sensitivity is maximized. So there really is there really is a critical point here, and but the system does not seem to be getting close to it. And we it seems that the it should be easy for the fish if they wanted to to get past to. Get to, to get to the state that is very collect as high collective sensitivity, but they just don't do it. And so the question now is why not? And so our initial thoughts on this, uh, which are in this paper under review now, is basically that well, if it, fish have other concerns than just being eaten by predators. So um, right, if I'm a fish, I also need to say eat, and if I'm always being uh, distracted from eating by um, all of these sort of false alarms that are propagating through the system, then maybe I don't want to be maximally collectively sensitive to predators. But there are other, other components to that fitness of the individual fish. Okay, so the moral of this last part. Uh, so here, this collective variable, interestingly, does seem to be tuned by the system. But this simple story of criticality is always best, which we tend to see in, in theoretical um, collective behavior studies, really needs to be rethought. 
Okay, so to step back quickly, basically uh, come back to our big question, what is the logic of collective behavior? And we're uh, addressing this question by taking these abstract theories and testing them using this detailed data. And if I had to summarize, basically, right, we've learned sort of a lot about each individual system, but the, the identification of these important collective variables and how they are tuned by the system is really key to how these systems work. And so this is uh, what we want to work on next is what is the feedback, right? If I'm an individual B, individual neuron, what am I watching to regulate my own behavior to get the right collective behavior? And I'll end here basically by saying, um, so I gave you three examples of data that we've worked with. We've worked with lots of other data too. Uh, in the bottom left there is the our macaques fighting. So monkey fights, we had great data about that. We've done in the bottom there, um, we had time series of worms and how, the, how worms move and how they decide uh, how fast to move when they're poked, basically. And in the bottom right, we're starting to work with some data from honeybees, uh, both their um, gene expression and their behavior. And so what I'm trying to say here is basically that we have experience in working in a lot of different, with a lot of different types of data. And so we welcome collaborations. It would be great if you have data from your favorite collective system uh, that we could write. Uh, we would love to work on it in the sense that we can test these abstract ideas and you also get something out of it by getting this predictive model of your particular system. And so, of course, this was a collective effort, right? Uh, all my collaborators and my students that I've worked with, I'd like to thank them and thank you for your attention. I'd love to take any questions. Well, thanks, Brian. That was a fascinating and extremely clear overview of uh, this type of approach and what the benefits are. Uh, let's open the floor for questions. Just unmute yourself and start talking. Hi, Brian. I have a quick uh, question. This might be a naive um, question, uh, maybe a little stupid, but um, but just as somebody who's a little naive to fish, is there a reason why um, those networks that you considered were only, you were only kind of considering information flowing through the visual modality when a lot of fish, and I think schooling fish, have access to, say, lateral lines. You mentioned they're also sensitive to chemical cues. So could there be, uh, I mean, if you were to change which fish they were aware of um, due to multimodal sensing, how would that affect your analysis? Exactly. You know, this is a very important issue. And particularly when, right, in our model, we sort of cram them all together, very close together. And you would actually expect them to get much more information from these lateral line things and things like this than just visual. And so there's some limitations to what we did there. But um, but it does seem, right, when we run the sort of regression to see what they're responding to, it does seem to be visual. Uh, that tends to pop out. And it's not just, uh, say, who is nearby, but it's also who you can see. But yeah, absolutely great question, yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Well, if not, uh, you know how to find Brian uh, because it's certainly something a lot to take in and take him up on uh, his offer to collaborate. Uh, we have done that in our studies of knowledge dynamics in a sort of scientific communities under the assumption that scientists are basically behaving like monkeys. So Brian's expertise was very helpful there. And the results are very interesting. So I can only encourage everybody to take Brian up uh, with his offer for collaboration here.
Okay, well then, um, uh, let me let you all go for lunch. Thanks everybody for participating in that series and see you all next term. <laughs>